So I've been really fortunate my whole running career. I've never had a major running related injury or health issue that's made me take more than a couple weeks at a time off. The last 10 years, I've been really fortunate to be able to race for podiums and Strava FKTs and wins and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden to get this health complication that's life-threatening, that totally takes away my whole competitive identity. And it made me suddenly question that, you know, maybe my career's over. Maybe this gift of running is, is getting stripped away from me. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it back out into the mountains. I don't know if I'm going to be able to win another race. I don't know if my sponsors are going to drop me. And it kind of makes you re-examine what running means in your life. As a professional athlete, you make money from doing races or doing events, meeting the community around the world, traveling internationally, and to have that all shut down for pretty much all of 2020, so many races being canceled, uh, being quarantined, staying in during COVID, it was a tough time. I still had some hip and back pain that I was dealing with pretty much all through 2020. So I was doing a lot of cross training, doing some ski mountaineering, riding my bike a bit more. Land the ball. Good. So I was really looking forward to 2021 and getting back out there and, and doing a lot of races uh, with things opening up quite a bit more. But I got a pulmonary embolism, blood clots in the lungs. <coughs> I had kind of just muscle spasm pain in my rib cage, and along my lower back there was a lot of pain. Uh, it got so bad those first couple of days I couldn't lie down to sleep at night. And they initially diagnosed it as pneumonia. I took some antibiotics for the first couple of weeks there, and it just didn't go away. And the antibiotics really just didn't do anything. It's hard to breathe. Get lightheaded. I tried to go out the door at a really slow jog on the flat bike pass in Boulder and I absolutely could not run even at my slowest pace for more than like 45 seconds without having to stop and walk and catch my breath. I really have to take walk breaks every minute. It's just like having an asthma attack. It's brutal. Well, I think it was a month after the first diagnosis of pneumonia where Sage was he really took a big step back and was in significant amount of pain. I just asked him, like, do you think it's time to go to the ER? And he was in enough pain where he said, yeah, it's time to go to the ER. I was kind of afraid of the cost. Uh, you know, I'm on a catastrophic health insurance plan, so it was uh, kind of scary, the thought of, of going to the ER and uh, racking up a lot of medical debt. We didn't have any answers, but they just wanted to run one test after another test after another test, and it's just like, this, this isn't good. Like we knew like it was, it wasn't pneumonia anymore. They ultimately diagnosed me with a bilateral pulmonary embolism. So I had substantial clots in both of my lungs and I actually didn't even know that that was what a pulmonary embolism was. Like you'd heard these things in health class and science class. Oh, pulmonary embolism, that sounds pretty serious. It has something to do maybe with the heart. I'm not worried about that. That's something for people much older than me, people that don't exercise. E.T. phone home. It kind of made me scared and depressed because there were so many unknowns and there still are a lot of unknowns, but at the same time, it also solved a lot of mysteries of why it had been so hard to breathe and why I was unable to run. But there's always the mystery of why it happened in the first place. Less than a year before Sage got the blood clot, I lost my sister um, from cancer. So just like not even a year later and here's Sage getting blood clots that he's been walking around with for a month and we didn't know. And that he could have he could have died like any day within that month. And it was just kind of a shock to the system, I think, that like here I am in this position where I could lose somebody else so close to me again. Sandy's support has been real key through all of this. 
Uh, she's always been there for me as well as, you know, encouraging me to get back into running. Still got some colors in the trees. I have this prescribed blood thinner pills. There is risk of bleeding out. If you're running outside on the trails and you cut yourself really bad or you fall and hit your head, you could really hurt yourself very seriously, very quickly, and uh, not get the help you need. So kind of as a precaution on those blood thinners all summer, I didn't get up into the high country. I didn't run fast on technical trails. I stuck to the flat trails, the safe trails. So now that it's fall, uh, I'm getting the itch to try to get my fitness back. That means running hard efforts, entering a race, or at least doing a competitive type of FKT effort where I could really push my heart and lungs and legs again and get out on the trails that I love so much and that I missed so much uh, over the summer. I just know Sage so well. I knew he was gonna try. There was never a concern once he got out of the hospital that um, he wasn't gonna come back. It just, I know other people thought that, but for me it's like, of course he's just gonna come back. So at about 3.30 in the morning on October 19th, 2021, a uh, fire broke out in downtown Boulder at an apartment complex. And uh, we just happened to be away that night. And we found out when we woke up in the morning, hours later, that the apartment complex that caught on fire in downtown Boulder was the one that we lived in. Initially, I think I just broke down in tears and got Sage, told him what happened. And I just remember we both just like collapsed against the bed and just sat there crying together for like 10 minutes. We just have a, had a small 400 square foot studio apartment there. Basically the whole complex quickly went up in flames. Everyone had to evacuate, everyone was safe. No one was seriously hurt even. Some people had to jump from the second and third floor balcony, which is where Sandy and I lived. And the top floor on that third floor was really what got destroyed. It was a big dream of his to have a place to own in Boulder. Um, like that was huge to him. Like I know some people just thought it was like some crappy studio apartment, but he was so proud of owning that space in, in Boulder, um, this big training mecca. We knew instantly that uh, everything was lost. If the flames and the heat didn't destroy all our personal items, then the smoke and the soot and uh, the water from all the fire hoses definitely did. Then a couple hours later, we we're just like, let's go for a run. <laughs> There's nothing else we can do right now. And I think that defines us a lot in Sage where it's like, bad things happen, let's go find something we appreciate about our lives right now. And that's really how we deal with most things. We'll get through this. Yep. Right, keep moving forward because that's all we can do. Love you. Sandy and I got really lucky. We found a rental pretty quickly after the fire because we knew we had to move somewhere and we found this great space in Salida. We're already conjuring up dreams of how we're gonna fill the space with exercise equipment, gym, guest futon, a king-size bed, uh, and the, a new couch in the living room. This is great. First item is the furniture we got delivered. That's the first time we've actually owned a couch and purchased one. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's awesome. great. The move was kind of seamless because we barely had any items. We just had a couple things in our two cars. No moving truck or anything this time. This clean space, this empty slate, is kind of fun to be able to fill and choose how we want to utilize it. So being in Boulder has always been the dream, uh, but sometimes the dreams kind of change slightly. 
And with this fire, we were kind of forced to look at other options. And there they go by. When I first met Sandy, she was living out in the middle of the state here in the big mountains out in Buena Vista and also Salida, Colorado. Come some more dogs. Sandy's always loved the Salida, Colorado area. And when we were in Boulder, we had actually always thought about maybe moving back out here, it's kind of a slower pace of life. Things are a little bit more relaxed. As I get older into my late 30s, it starts becoming harder as a runner to adjust to the competitive scene. Uh, you know your VO2 max is starting to drop, maybe you don't have the speed or recovery that you used to have, and so you start looking for kind of some financial backup. You can't always rely on your legs to make money. This way, turn up here, walk for ice, you can go straight up the path there. If I'm not able to get back into competitive racing, I'd really love to be involved in mountain ultra trail running for the rest of my life in some capacity, not as a competitive athlete, but as someone who's doing something else. Good job, keep it up. Across the bridge. Sage would have to find a way to do something with, with his energy because he's been a runner his whole life. It's obviously a big part of his identity. It's not the only part of him. He loves videos, loves animals. If you know him, you can talk about anything. Good work. Nice job. Cross the road, follow the path. Sandy and I started Higher Running as a way to coach athletes online. Hi, I'm running coach Sandy Nightpaver, and today I'm going to give you a few tips to build a runner-specific strength routine. Higher Running is really about athlete empowerment, and we try to cater to runners doing any surface, any distance. We're doing our best to reach everybody in a way that meets them where they're at. Your speed changes with your pace or your velocity. Speed is a product of your stride rate times your stride length. I started my YouTube channel, VO2Max Productions, back in college, right when YouTube was just starting out. I just wanted to share some fun workout videos and other funny videos with my friends on the internet. We're doing the Krispy Kreme Donut 5K Challenge. It's 12 donuts, regular, original glaze, 12 and a half laps on the track. I think when people see Sage on YouTube, some people might think like he's just playing a character. And it's like, no, that's Sage. Um, <laughs> really, it's Sage. Like he, he's an entertainer at heart. It, it's funny to say that because he's also an introvert and he can be quite shy. YouTube is work now, but it's also work that I really enjoy. If I'm not able to get back into competitive racing, I'm gonna lean in more and really double down on social media paid gigs and working on marketing and YouTube and maybe having to find another career outside of the sport. Back at the doctor's office today, I'm getting some routine blood work done just to check my levels. I've been building up my mileage, putting in the vertical and feeling a lot stronger. So I think it's time to really let it rip and test that fitness in an all out effort. I've decided to come out here to the island of Maui and do an FKT effort from the ocean floor up here to the top of the volcano and back down again. It'll be a good 37 mile long run with over 10,000 feet of climbing on gnarly technical trails. So staying hydrated, staying fueled is gonna be a huge challenge as well. And the skeletal muscular fatigue of just climbing up and down 10,000 feet on technical trails is gonna test me and push my limits. This is the trail that we're going up and down. 
I, it might change names as you get down, but you have to get down pretty far. I'm fortunate to have Sandy out here crewing for me, and uh, really just appreciate her support every step of the way, uh, training in Colorado, and now out here for these FKT efforts and races. I'm putting some pressure on myself because it's my first real test back since my illness and my first real test to see if I could race at the level uh, that I used to in the past before I had my pulmonary embolism. So it's a bit nerve wracking and uh, it's something that hopefully will be a big confidence booster. I think I could set the record and take some time off of it, but like I said, there's a lot of unknowns and I could fail miserably and that's kind of part of the game, that's part of the challenge. Uh, it makes me nervous, but I'm gonna try to finish it for sure. There's a lot of challenges that worry me with all the heat and humidity. Getting dehydrated is one of them. I'm gonna be geared up with full pack basically with trekking poles and a lot of spring energy gels. I'm also a little worried about route finding, but I have the GPX track on my Coros watch. There's a lot of vegetation I know that could cut you up or get you turned around. There's uh, feral pigs, there's guard dogs to the, some of the ranch areas, uh, there's wild goats. Climbing up to 10,000 feet uh, is definitely gonna be a huge challenge to the heart and lungs. It's 10,000 feet of climbing over 37 miles. A lot of it's really gnarly and technical. It's gonna be hot and humid. It could be cold on the summit. So it'll be a true test to see where I'm at in my buildup for ultra marathons, especially mountain ultra marathons. Good job, Sage. Four oh eight thirty three. There's a dog out there. I need to see him. A lot of feral goats. Thanks, The main reason I think Hawaii was worth it for Sage was the confidence boost. Doing something big and enjoying it is really like a big step in the right direction. It's kind of like uh, weight training for your lungs, like you're exercising your lungs, you're kind of getting that muscle memory, uh, the kind of that feeling of what it, what you need to do to expand your diaphragm and hopefully improve uh, the efficiency of each, each breath. The FKT effort in Hawaii went really well. The time it took me to recover uh, and get my heart and lungs feeling more normal again took a lot longer than I thought it would. Therefore, I decided to look for races a little bit later in the year. And so I selected the Canyons 100K as my first competitive ultra marathon race back. Sage typically trains himself for races. There are times he's done very well. 
There are times it's like he knows what he's supposed to do and he would tell other people to do it. He just needs to apply it to himself a little bit better. I would like to think he's getting better with age. We, we shall see. <laughs> Another challenge, of course, of being at altitude in Colorado in the winter is that some workouts you really want good traction. You don't want to be worrying about slipping on snow or going through a bunch of ice if you're trying to get power in your stride and running hard. I got a new incline trainer set up to really help gain that vertical when it's icy and cold out and I'm worried about slipping and falling. When you're on the treadmill training inside, you could really mimic the heat training. I could overdress, I could control the temperature, I could control the incline, and I think that's really gonna be beneficial. Sage spends a lot of time on the treadmill, which I think is good for canyons. If I could put in a solid training block, do all this vertical, hit the mileage goals I need to, dial in my heat training as well, I really feel like I could be competitive again on the international racing scene. We're here in Auburn for the Canyons 100K. The Canyons 100K runs from Auburn, California, kind of backwards on the Western States 100 course for the most part. This year it's a net uphill race with about 15,000 feet of climbing. I'm on social media a lot and you get a lot of support through the running community across the world uh, because of that platform but it's not quite the same as seeing people in person. I'm sure all your YouTube fans want to know, are you going to bring back your music videos? Are you sticking to your career as a dancer? I mean, despite my, my brief uh, hiatus of, of trying to do some TikTok dance videos, I think I will have to go back to trying to do some poorly done musical covers uh, for YouTube videos. When you look at the ultra trail running community in general, You've got a lot of people that have overcome all sorts of adversity, whether they had a traumatic event happen to them previously, or they've had a drug addiction, or they've had their own health issues, or their own fires or floods to deal with. People are always coming from different stories and backgrounds and using running as a way to unite together, to get to run with them in person in beautiful areas and share that commonality, share the beautiful trails together. Uh, it was really inspiring and motivating to me. Since it's been over two years since I last towed the starting line, I'm a bit extra nervous heading into this. It's kind of like you want to brush off the rust and you're not sure exactly where you stack up. I've done some hard workouts and training in the FKT effort in Hawaii that have kind of been confidence builders, but you still don't know exactly how things are gonna shake out in a competitive environment like a race. Just being here, just having the opportunity to tow the starting line and compete feels like a win to me. Like, it's a big privilege and just having the support of Sandy and my parents and the sponsors and the running community means the world to me. And just being alive and Being able to do what I love, like get out on the mountain trails and be in these races again is a win. Like I'm still alive, I'm still here. Uh, you have to celebrate that. Like that's, that's the most important.
currently waiting at Forest Hill for Sage. We saw him at Driver's Flat, the last crewing aid station. He looked okay. He did tell me he was having some breathing issues. Um, that he saw at the bathroom, but otherwise I thought he looked he looked okay. Not great, but we'll see. <laughs> Stop aid station. I'm eating extra. You know, it's never a good thing when you just stop and crack your pubis um, or try to. Uh, it seems like he's in good spirits. He's not having his best day right now. in the line. Please welcome Sage Canada. Crossing the finish line today, it was it's a big relief. It wasn't what I wanted and I was definitely pretty disappointed. It was a tough reality, this race. Uh, I was hoping to place maybe top 10, top 15, ideally top five, but it's a really competitive field. There were a lot of really strong runners here and uh, I went for it. I tried to go out in the top 10, top 12 for the first six miles or so and I realized my breathing was pretty labored for me to, to let the lead pack go, to let the top 15 guys go and kind of be in no man's land uh, was really humbling. But it still seems like my lung function, I'm just off. That last 10 to 15 percent, I can't get back and I don't know if I ever will. That kind of scares me. I feel very fortunate to be able to toe the line again. Seeing the community, so many people cheering, the aid station support, the volunteers, fellow competitors, their sense of encouragement, as well as all the crew support I had. I felt like I was a, a race car in a pit stop uh, with, with Sandy and my parents there all working on me at every aid station. There were a couple times today where I felt like maybe I should just retire. But uh, no, I love the sport too much. I love the community. I love being out on the trails. But uh, I do want to keep trying. I do want do want to keep pushing. And the reality is, maybe I won't be back to to where I was 10 years ago or five years ago before the pulmonary embolism. But that's also kind of just a, a tough reality that a lot of pro runners face. I kind of hoped it would be maybe in my late 40s or when I was like 50. But maybe it happened a little earlier. And uh, I. 
might have to accept that, and that that's a tough thing. It, it kind of uh, makes me sad, but uh, you know things like that happen in life, and uh, you do the best you can with the body you have, and uh, whether or not these changes are, are permanent or I could change my training in the future to, to overcome some of the breathing issues I felt like I was having today uh, is yet to be determined. Finishing was really the first win and just being able to tow the starting line was also a real win and a real plus and just being alive is also a huge one. So I can't be too disappointed with the finishing results, but I expect more. Racing a fast, competitive, runnable race made me realize that maybe in the future I should do more technical courses. Maybe my future is more 100 mile races or longer FKT efforts because there's a chance that my lungs aren't the same and I don't have the climbing power on runnable terrain that I used to have in the shorter distance races. So I really want to finish strong at some of the longer ultra marathon distances. And I think the 100 mile distance might actually suit me better now than the shorter, more runnable stuff. As a pro athlete, you're constantly trying to evolve. You're constantly trying to adapt to new challenges and create new ways to make a living in the sport. Whether it's competitive finishes or being more active on social media, sometimes you have to try new things or explore new avenues and new options. So I'm not done yet. Being out on the trails again in nature just really puts things all in perspective and makes me appreciate the gift of life that I've still been given.